To respond uh, to this question briefly without trying to rehash an entire lecture I gave um, uh, about uh, Bitcoin in the past that realized that this is the fatwa that has just been released by a particular Muslim country. To be honest, I read it. There's nothing new in it per se. Uh, the same arguments are hashed and rehashed about uh, Bitcoin and about uh, cryptocurrencies overall for the last six, seven years. And respected ulama and respected councils have spoken about this. And there are predominantly two main camps. The first of them, which is this country and other uh, grand, you know, uh, great scholars, I should say, they say that it is completely impermissible. It is haram. And they have a number of, you know, various evidences, they, you know, five or six they mention, and I have gone over this in a longer Q&A. Uh, and the second uh, position, which is what I have advocated and the Fiat Council of North America, and many uh, uh, finance experts uh, across the globe, I have read a number of fatawas from scholars in England, from scholars in Malaysia, from scholars in France, from scholars in Saudi Arabia, uh, who have written treatises and papers on uh, Bitcoins, uh, on Bitcoin in particular, that they say that it is halal. And uh, in the end of the day, really, uh, dear brother, you will have to follow the authorities whom you trust because this is uh, a new matter and both sides have respected ulama and scholars. And I have been teaching respect of scholarly opinions, you know, even as I position or even if I have championed my own position and argue my own case, this is my opinion. In the end of the day, dear brother, you have to follow the group of scholars that you trust and the rest is, you know, uh, uh, between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But you've asked me to comment on this and I will simply comment by stating that the position of those who say that it is permissible, Bitcoin is permissible and I'm one of them and the Fiqh Council of North America that I belong to also gave this fatwa is basically the, the, the default. They don't need to bring any evidences. They say the default when it comes to all types of transactions is that they are permissible. Whoever bans it, whoever makes it haram, the proof of burden is on them. And they say, we say, I say that all of these evidences that they bring to talk about Bitcoin being haram do not reach the level of making it haram. The max that they can say is that it is speculative and perhaps dangerous for an investment and perhaps not wise to do. But to make something haram based upon the arguments that they bring, we feel, many scholars feel that they simply haven't done that. And because of this, Bitcoin remains upon its default, which is that it is halal. In other words, the onus of the proof is on them. The onus of the burden is on them. And every single point that they bring to make Bitcoin haram, if you were to take that point, you could apply it to many other things that the same group makes halal. Please understand what I'm saying here. Every single point that they bring to say that Bitcoin is haram, you can bring that same issue, whether it's speculation, whether it's uh, the fact that, you know, we don't know the, 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 the price is going to be, whether it's the fact that they believe it doesn't have tangible value, uh, and we can extrapolate this to other things as well, that you think it doesn't have tangible value, the people think it does have tangible value. So whatever uh, criticism that they bring, you can extrapolate it to other things that the same group will allow, and therefore we, we we find that in reality, the aspects that they bring to criticize uh, Bitcoin are not strong enough to make it um, haram. And also realize that uh, the issue of cryptocurrencies is, is overall a relatively new market. It's literally a decade old, a decade and you know a year, I mean, 11 years literally. And so there's a lot of controversies and don't be surprised if people's fatwas changed or are modified over time. A lot of people, a lot of scholars are not really understanding what Bitcoin is and, and cryptocurrencies in general. And, uh, you know, I advise those of you that are interested to basically do your own research. By the way, each cryptocurrency, it has a white paper uh, that is authored by uh, the people who have founded the particular cryptocurrency and the information about it is uh, uh, is available online. This white paper, it, uh, it uh, throws light on a number of aspects most importantly, the purpose behind the Bitcoin, uh, sorry, the purpose behind the crypto technology, the cryptocurrency, and also the technology that it, that is used. Now, uh, the issue uh, of Bitcoin in particular, there have been quite a lot of fatwas given about Bitcoin in particular. I am not aware of any detailed fatwa that has gone into cryptocurrencies overall. I'm sure there are, I just haven't come across them. Cryptocurrencies is broader than Bitcoin. Bitcoin is the first 
and the most famous, and as of today, it is the most expensive, or as of right now, it is the most expensive uh, Bitcoin. But the fatwas that have been given are particularly about Bitcoin, and you can extrapolate them to Ethereum and to some of the more established uh, coins. The problem comes, there's no question that because of the success of Bitcoin, a lot of uh, cryptocurrencies have been formed that are completely useless. They are formed by unscrupulous people who basically want to enact a large Ponzi scheme. A Ponzi scheme is where you take the investment of the later group in order to pay off the earlier group so that it looks to the earlier group that a profit has been made. The people feel there's a profit being made and so they come in. The next wave is then used to pay the middle wave and then the middle wave makes a profit and then when you get a very large profit, all of a sudden somebody disappears, the Ponzi scheme collapses and it turns out it was a huge fraud from the beginning. And this is named after one of the first people to do this, so Ponzi was his name, so it's called the Ponzi scheme. There's no question that some of the newer cryptocurrencies, uh, many of them might actually be elaborate Ponzi schemes. However, just because some of these or many of these are Ponzi schemes, it doesn't mean that every one of them is. So we don't throw out you know, all of the apples in the barrel just because one or two or even 10 apples are, are bad or, or corrupted. We look at them, you know, bit by bit, <laughs> bit by bit, pun intended with Bitcoin. And uh, Bitcoin in particular, the Fiqh Council has issued a fatwa by naming Bitcoin only. And we did not talk about the rest of the cryptocurrencies. Now we can extrapolate, as we said, to the stable and the established uh, currencies uh, in the cryptocurrency market, such as Ethereum, such as Cardano, such as uh, Tether. These are established by now and uh, the Fiqh Council's fatwa can easily be extrapolated to these ones as well. Basically, any established coin that has a legitimate purpose and that is based on the block, uh, blockchain technology, uh, it does appear that you know, once it is established and people are now actually using it uh, in the real world, that inshallah it will meet the same criteria as uh, Bitcoin. Now, as I said, the problem comes these fatwas that make Bitcoin haram, uh, they use generic, generic things, generic matters that are not themselves applied consistently to other matters. So for example, one of the biggest things that is mentioned is they say the price is speculative. We do not know one day is gonna go high, the other day is gonna go low. And of course, so are the prices of stocks. So are the prices of currency trade. We do not know if there's a crisis in, let's say Japan tomorrow, Japan, uh, the, the Japanese yen and the American dollar, the, uh, the, the, the exchange rate might change completely. It's very volatile, especially if a country is engaging in trade or civil war or something of this nature, things might happen. Just because it's speculative, it does not make it haram. The fact that the price is unknown or the price might easily go up and down does not make uh, the, the product uh, haram or the issue haram. Uh, another issue that is raised is that Bitcoin is not backed by a government, hence it is not an established currency. And this is uh, a semi-valid point in that it is not backed by a government. But then the next issue, hence it is not an established currency, that's where the big question mark comes because the Quran and Sunnah does not define what a currency is. And especially in our times, when pretty much all of the currencies or most of the currencies of the world are no longer linked to actual gold and silver. You know, President Nixon in 1971 famously, he uh, delinked the US dollar from gold. And so what exactly is a currency? What constitutes mal? What can be used to, be, uh, to, to exchange commodities or to use as uh, the basic measure by which to buy and sell things? What has monetary value? Is it only gold and silver? Some fuqaha said that by the way, and there are people even today calling for a return of the gold standard and the gold dinar. And you know, I mean, utmost respect to them. I have nothing against that. And you know, uh, in some ways, wallahi, it makes a lot of sense. I'm not against that, but that's not how the world actually works and the American dollar and the British uh, pound sterling and you know the Japanese yen, they are not linked to any actual commodity. They are quite literally printed by their governments and people ha give value to them because they trust their governments. So because of this, quite a number of fuqaha, even in early Islam, even in medieval Islam, they did they they said that that mal, a monetary uh, you know currency, does not have to be tangible per se. And many of the Shafi'i scholars, Imam Masyuti and others, are of this opinion. Even some of the modern Hanafis, and Mufti Taqir Uthmani, uh, is also of the opinion that if a non-tangible uh, uh, item such as hukuk or rights and benefits 
attains value according to the custom of the people, then it can be treated as mal. And so Mufti Taqi and others, Imam Suyuti and before him and whatnot, they say we look at the urf or the prevalent customs of the people. We look at what people do business with. And if they give value to something, and if they consider something to be worthy of value, then it can in fact gain that value. And the whole point of Bitcoin is to break away from centralized banks. Those fuqaha who criticize Bitcoin by saying it's not backed up by a government, with utmost respect, it's as if they've kind of lost the whole point of Bitcoin, because that is exactly what Satoshi, the founder of Bitcoin, actually intended. He wanted a currency that is decentralized. He wanted a currency that is not linked to any government, government because he felt that governments are manipulative, that governments are elitist, that governments are themselves inflating the value of their own currency by printing or not printing or by doing whatever. So he wanted a currency that is truly global and that has no one entity or cabal that monitors it. And he wanted a, a, a currency that would be decided, its price would be decided by all of mankind. Its market value will be equally, everybody gets to decide how much uh, you know a, a Bitcoin is worth. Not the elitist banks or the governments or whatnot. He wanted it to be a truly open, democratic, if you like, uh, system. So the notion of Bitcoin not being backed by a government is absolutely correct. But that's the whole point of the uh, Bitcoin. So the claim that Bitcoin has imaginary value, I mean, to be cynical here, the same can be said, to be brutally honest, of, of, of the American dollar or the British pound. That technically, I mean, if you were to use, if you were to go to the jungles of, you know, some land that has no uh, fiat currency and try to use these this paper money, they would just look at you and say, what, what is this? What am I going to do with this, right? And uh, there's an example that, uh, you know, uh, uh, has, has been given by a certain scholar uh, who talked about uh, uh, Bitcoin. I forgot his name now. I'm not trying to take credit for this example, but uh, I remember hearing this in a lecture that the example of Bitcoin somewhat is like when you go to an amusement park and you at the, at the when you enter the amusement park you hand over some money and you get some tokens and these tokens are used for rides inside the amusement park right some rides have one coin some rides have two coins now these coins they have value inside of the amusement park and they have value within that system. And everybody understands when you're within that system that this coin, this, this token, it has value. However, outside of the amusement park, if you were to take this you know, token that is used in the amusement park and you were to try to buy food outside of the amusement park or you go to another place, they're gonna just look at you, what is this? We don't know what it is. So this token has value amongst a certain group of people. And it has no value amongst another group of people. The fact that one group does not consider it to have value doesn't mean that it actually doesn't have value. And a simple example here, that suppose you purchase, let's say 10 of these tokens, you go to the amusement park, you have uh, uh, 10 of these tokens, okay? And you wanna play some games and you know, you wanna do some rides and whatever. And then all of a sudden, you know, your, your, your wife calls you up and says, where are you? Uh, you? You have some guests coming. By the way, what are you doing at an amusement park without your wife? There's but anyway, hypothetical example. Your wife calls you up and says, you, you need to be home and you have these 10 tokens, right? And you have to leave the amusement park. What if you were to sell these tokens on the spot to somebody else? And, and suppose that that person didn't want to walk all the way back to the entrance. Suppose it's like, you know, Disney World. Those of you that have been, it's a massive, you know, park and you don't use cash in there, by the way. You do not use actual cash. They have a, their own currency, you know, inside, by the way, this is real. They have their own currency, their own tokens and whatnot inside a, a Disney World, right? So suppose that person didn't want to walk all the way 20 minutes and those tokens, you purchase them for $10. You're like, okay, uh, I have these 10 tokens. You want them for 20? Instead of walking back, I have them right here. And suppose the, 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 the token place closed down and now you have the tokens, you have the ability to sell them inside the park. Is anybody gonna say that is haram? It's clear, it's halal, because you have the tokens and this person wants to buy them. And according to you and this person, this token has meaningful value. It has something that the people inside this park, they, uh, they, they believe. So what exactly constitutes fake currency? 
In reality, a currency is only as strong as the people who believe in it. And the more people believe in it, the stronger it becomes. So you now have established cryptocurrencies. Bitcoin is the most established. And because it has a limited amount and because it is having every so many years and within uh, you know a, a few decades, there will be no more Bitcoins to actually produce, right? So Bitcoins are being mined if you know how they're produced. And so once you purchase a Bitcoin, you are, or, you know, uh, or, or even a fraction of a Bitcoin, that is it you are taking a permanent you know uh, portion and and uh, once the bitcoin runs out there will not be any more bitcoins produced after that it's going to be bartering it's going to be handing bitcoins over back and forth the same goes for ethereum and cardano and tether and all of these major ones that they do have value amongst the people who believe in them millions and millions of people in fact some governments have now opened up the door to accept Bitcoin as their official currencies as well. A number of governments have begun this, right? And so the claim that Bitcoin has no intrinsic value is simply the same as saying, you know, uh, uh, the, the, the money that is used inside of Disney World has no value. No, it does have value for the people who believe in it. By the way, just FYI, when it comes to cryptos and Bitcoin, there are two major categories of people. The first of them, well, there's a third, they don't want to get involved, that's fine. Two that are actually involved. The first of them, they want to get rich off of it in dollars or in their currency. So they want to buy when it's dip and then want to sell when it rises, right? And this is probably the majority of the people. They want to buy and this is in and of itself halal because it's like imagine if the, 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 the Japanese uh, yen and the American dollar, uh, imagine if you felt because you were expert in Japanese, uh, you know, foreign policy, you felt that, you know, uh, the dollar is going to rise in power. So you invested in this in order to then mark it off of the Japanese yen. That's your speculation. It's halal in and of itself, you know, as long as it's done on the spot and, 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 and the money exchange is done immediately, it is halal. So if you do this with Bitcoin, Coin as well. It is intrinsically halal, nothing wrong with that uh, per se. But you have a second group of people, and these are called the hodlers, H A D L, hodl. And that basically means you're going to hold on and never let go. And these people actually believe that Bitcoin and these other cryptocurrencies will eventually replace the dollar, or if not replace, at least become an actual bona fide global currency. Now, that might seem far-fetched, but if anybody is following what's going on in the world, day by day, news keeps on coming out that seems to indicate that Bitcoin and Ethereum and these major brands really are situating themselves to become a de facto currency within maybe even a decade, if not earlier than that. So what people used to scoff at five, seven years ago, now it seems to be pretty uh, pretty mainstream and, and perhaps even you can see it in the near future. Anyway, the point being that um, the, the, the claim that uh, Bitcoin is haram because it is imaginary or because it is speculative, or I mean, some people say it's haram because uh, Bitcoin is used for haram purposes. And again, this is, I mean, with utmost respect, whoever says this, I, I really think they haven't studied uh, the basics of, of the reality of how Bitcoin is being used. Of course, Bitcoin is used for haram. Is cash not used for haram? If cash itself cannot, can it not be used for haram? Of course it can. To make something haram because you, an evil person is using it for haram makes no sense. It depends on the functionality. In and of itself, currencies are neutral. And whether somebody uses them for good or evil, the currency itself will remain neutral. Now, what this group says is that the anonymity of the user is what makes it haram. And to respond to this, one can say, you know what, Annie, the anonymity of a cash giver can also be, you can come with a you know, uh, full veil and, and give a cash over to some criminal or something. And even, by the way, wire transfers. I mean, was it last year where almost a billion dollars were you know, wired uh, via, via, via an elaborate scam in Bangladesh somewhere, something like this, some, some major uh, you know, scandal happened. I mean, where there's a will, there's a way. To make all of bank money haram, meaning bank wire transfers, because somebody can use it for haram. To make all of crypto or Bitcoin haram because people buy drugs or do haram because of it. Again, it's not a uh, uh, it's not a, a legitimate reason to make the entire currency or the entire issue haram. These are simply, uh, like I said, the max that can be said. You tell the person to use it for um, halal. So the 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 fatwa uh, for, of the Fiqh Council and others remains, and uh, and I myself don't see any problem to rethink through this that. 
all of these issues that are being raised uh, about Bitcoin and others, they have been responded to quite quite easily, to be honest. And I really don't see the max that can be said. By the way, the fact that these councils say that it is halal, like the Fiqh Council, that doesn't mean that they are endorsing you to go and actually use it. They're simply saying it's not haram. And in fact, in our Fiqh Council, we actually said at the very last line is that we caution people to, yes, just because it's halal doesn't mean it's wise. They're two different things. You can, it, something can be halal, but unwise. So you have to yourself think about whether you want to get involved. Uh, yes, it is a volatile market. And the Sharia does ask that you preserve your wealth and therefore, what the advice that I would give is the advice that many people are giving. Do not invest in cryptos and especially in Bitcoin and what and, and, and whatnot more than you can afford to lose. Be cautious and it is best to be cautious. And if you want to avoid it completely, no doubt that that would be the safest uh, thing to do. Now, as for other cryptocurrencies, uh, as I said, this is a case by case basis. And uh, I don't think anybody can say that all cryptocurrencies are halal because some of them are clearly Ponzi schemes and some of them are clearly uh, meant to deceive. Some of them are used for like they're meant to use for filth or pornography or, or haram. So clearly any crypto that is meant to be used for drugs and whatnot. So the purpose of it, in other words, the name and the transaction, it is meant for haram. There are specific, niche specific, a lot of people don't know this. There are niche specific cryptocurrencies. So for example, there's cryptocurrencies for dentists. That's a valid cryptocurrency. There's cryptocurrencies for the types of business transactions. There's cryptocurrencies for niche markets. They're saying this is going to be the way forward. Okay. I mean, I understand that, but there are cryptocurrencies for haram things as well. Like drugs like alcohol, like yani fahish and whatnot. Clearly, those cryptocurrencies are harm, no question about it. And there are also cryptocurrencies that seem to be very fake or Ponzi schemes. Those two would be haram. But any currency that is based on your standard blockchain technology and is established by large groups of people such that really it's impossible, really almost impossible, realistically impossible for it to collapse or become a Ponzi scheme. Generally speaking, uh, the default of the Sharia would still be that these types of things are halal. Whether they're wise or not, that is up to you to decide. And the default position that I would say is that do not get involved in cryptos unless A, you really know what you're doing, you have studied, you have done your job researching, and then B, you only put in enough that you you can really afford to lose if la qadar Allah something were to happen then yani, it's a loss but it's not the end of your livelihood or life so be wise the sharia wants you to protect your income and savings and so with that I respect the, the scholars who gave this fatwa. I respect the council may Allah Azza wa Jal uh, an interest by the way I have to say this the country that said it is haram last week the neighboring country another Muslim majority country, their council said it is halal. So go figure, you have two Muslim majority countries, right? And one council said it is haram and the council next door said it is halal. So again, with utmost respect to all of our viewers here and, and to the people of the council, you have to decide who do you trust and you have to decide whether the person that you're listening to really does understand what cryptocurrencies and Bitcoin is and whether they've done the research and whether they're qualified to issue the verdict. You make that decision and then leave the rest. Don't worry respect the other opinion and I respect this council and the fatwa that it has given and you follow what you think is the, the, the better opinion. Wallahu ta'ala alam. And with that, inshallah, we come to the conclusion of today's lecture. We'll continue bi'inlahi ta'ala in our next session. Until then, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.